Come on, give God a hand, praise for the awesome God that he is. Amen. Today, what I want to do, uh, I want to, let me begin, first of all, by thanking um, Pastor Karen for the word last week. Come on, show us some love. And yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, she began, she um, really began opening the door to lay the foundation for uh, where we're going to be for the upcoming week. So I'll be talking about that for a little bit to kind of lay some foundation on the issue and the concept of worship. So we want to make a shift there. So today, um, I'm going to do uh, just kind of lay some more foundation, and we're going to take about two or three weeks. We'll see what God says to kind of unpack that and get to uh, the place that God would have us to go. But uh, I want to show you all, uh, I got three pictures. I have three pictures to show you all. Um, if we can put the first one on the screen. Uh, last week, I kind of did something a little crazy, and um, if they can get that up there, kind of want to, I don't know if they can get, yeah. See that little boat? I, uh, I took a week. And I went on that little sailboat with 20 people that I have no idea who they are. And we went and sailed the ocean. I'm talking about awesome, man. I mean, this thing, yes, don't be clapping because I got sick like a dog. <laughs> I mean, we went out there and, and, and I was praying, you know, Lord, peace be still. If Jesus could say it, I could say it. Peace be still. And God wanted to show me that I wasn't Jesus, so he caused a storm to come. Yeah, yeah, Lord Jesus, yeah. And, you know, and they put the sails up in the storm. Y'all seen those movies where those boats be rocking like this? And then the sail touched the water? Lord, yeah, yeah. Bro, man was like, I, I'm stupid, Lord. Forgive me. You know? <laughs> but we did. We just uh, went to different places and just jumped off that thing in the middle of the ocean and went diving. It was great. Um, as you can see, just no place to sleep, just like sleeping underneath. So uh, no shower, but the ocean. I still smell good. I still smell good. Um, and go to the last slide real quick. And my life was in the hand of these three guys. They kind of pair you up with on diving buddies. So it's a guy I met from Indiana, one from um, Dominican Republic, and myself. And when you go under the water, we're like 100 and something feet down, just hanging out. You got to keep your eye on each other because that's, that's your lifeline. And so I had a blast, man. I mean, I saw some whales and, yeah, and like bull sharks and prayed and saw sharks and prayed some more. It was like the blast. It was, yeah, this is good stuff, you know. Um, I, I should say that I bring some sea moss. Yeah, it was, just, it was just a great, great time. If, I, I, you know, for those of you that don't know me, I love the ocean. Um, I, I think that when you're under the water, you see... God's creation from a different perspective. It's the most amazing thing. It's the most amazing thing where on land we have mountains and, and all this kind of stuff going on. It's the same thing under the ocean with a completely different animal life. And I'm just looking like, man, if God could create this, right? Yes, yeah, so I spent my time under the water for the past seven days just worshiping God. So, it was good. 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 Okay. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 4. I want to begin laying foundation for um, what we're going to talk about. Um, and I am not one that normally says to say this, but I want to invite you to um, a chance to download the podcast from um, the, ser the sermon on the woman of Samaria. Uh, it was preached about two weeks ago before Pastor Karen preached. And, and I would just want to challenge you to listen to it carefully and take some notes as you're listening, because for the next few weeks, I'll be pulling bits and pieces from that particular message to talk more about um, what worship is all about. And so today, I want to just revisit, and I'm using the operative term, revisit Revelation chapter 4 to kind of talk about um, about what Jesus meant when he said what he said to the woman. Here is how that story goes. Uh, last week, but well, before I even go here, uh, Pastor Karen said some things last week. She said uh, she went and saw the movie Concussion, and in that movie, um, the NFL was bragging about them um, taking Sunday away from the church. Those of you that saw that, y'all saw that? And, and how the church has lost Sunday to the NFL. Sad but true. Come on, sad but true. And Pastor Karen made the statement that God wants his Sunday back. Um, she did. She said that. And, and I agree with that. I want to add something to that. Um, God doesn't want his Sunday back. God wants his week back. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the reason I want to say that, because um, Pastor Karen and I, and I almost said Pastor Kay, she ain't my wife, she's Pastor Karen, yeah. Uh, <laughs> We've been going back and forth yesterday. I, 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 I don't know that we really know what worship is, okay? Because a lot of us restrict worship to Sunday, and we get pumped up for Sunday. You kind of get what I'm saying? Um, if, you, if we understand worship is, is seven days a week, and it's not relegated to one day, you won't wait till Sunday to get yours. Are you with me? Come on, I, I want y'all to hear me. I want I want you to hear this. And if we understand what worship really is, uh, it doesn't matter who's playing or who's doing what, the God that we worship will always take first place. Does this make sense, guys? And so, and so here, here, here's Pastor Karen in her message. She kind of talked about that when, we, when it comes and we choose to worship, we must get rid of the fast, I, false idols or the false god. The way I said that with the woman of Samaria is that um, when it comes to us worshiping God, God's going to call us to go call our husbands, right? Whatever it is that we have set up that takes the place of worship, the worship of God in our lives, he's going to call us to go get that thing and come back and worship him. The, the issue that I want us to understand this morning, um, that, that when we bring that thing to God, it's not restricted to a place or a day of the week. Okay? Worship is done in the spirit. Come on, I want you all to hear me carefully. Worship is done in the spirit. And if we understand that worship really is done in spirit and in truth, it doesn't matter where you are, you can worship God. Amen. Right? So like me, in the bottom of an ocean, 100 and something feet down, can still worship God. Me, in the midst of a crazy storm, can still worship God. Didn't matter what was going on. I can still worship God because all I need to do is get in the spirit and stay there. Okay, and I'm going to talk plain to you because I want you to grab what I'm going to say, and I'm going to move through this text really, really fast because you might be hanging out here for a little while. Worship is not something you come in and out of. Worship is not something that starts and stops. Worship is a continual lifestyle. Okay, so here, you know, let, me, let me just make this statement, and I'll figure out how to flesh it out throughout the, the, the duration of the message uh, if we get there. Um, we should live our life from the perspective of always being in the presence of God, and then everything else flows out of that. Let me tell you what I mean by that. And you hear this over and over and over again. If I am always in worship, everything I do in life is out of worship. And if I'm always living in the presence of God, I can't cuss you out because God is with me. <laughs> right? I can't get in some crazy altercation with my brother or sister in Christ because God is with me. Because we don't understand that, here's what happens. We get mad with you. We step out of worship. And we go off on you. And then we forget to go back in. You see what happens? You kind of get what I'm saying? So here's, here's Jesus. Um, when we come out, I want you all to hear me say this. When we come out of worship, we're no longer in the spirit. We're in the flesh. And so flesh gives birth to, yeah. So the sin things that I do is because I stopped worshiping and started to do me. And if you're waiting only for Sunday to begin your worship experience, you won't understand what I'm saying. Does this make sense? Okay. So Revelation chapter 4, let's walk this out. Let's walk this out. I'm going to walk you through a couple of things. Um, and then we, uh, I'm going to invite you to come on Wednesday because Wednesday we'll deal with the details that's associated with the text. And we're going to walk through it to get to where God would have us to go. If you can put the big idea on the screen, um, we're going to resolve to worship God. Get this in your spirit, okay? Every believer is invited into God's throne room. Ooh, don't miss that statement. Get excited when I hear it. So we can develop a lifestyle of continual worship, which results from an encounter with God's holiness, his eternal greatness, his sovereignty, his majesty, and his splendor. Let me read it again. 
Every believer is invited into God's throne room so they can develop a lifestyle of continual worship. Say continual worship. Say it again. Say continual worship, which results from an encounter with God, okay, um, with his holiness, with his greatness, with his sovereignty, and his majesty. Go to Revelation. I am going to read this a section at a time, and I want to depict what's really happening here. And so I need you guys to bear with me, because out of this, we're going to flow into our communion service. And the good news about today is I have till 4 o'clock to deliver this message. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, I'm preach my stuff off. Amen. Good. We got time to work this out. No, we'll get you out in time, because... So you also got to go get those wings on the fire and all that stuff. I get it. Yeah. I, I get it. It's true. I mean, I get it. Yeah. Okay. Verse 1. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. And let me be very elementary and let me walk you through this because I don't want you to miss what I'm saying. Okay. This is in the middle of Re- Revelation. And then notice what it says. Verse 1 opens up by saying, After this, I looked up and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here, I will show you what must take place after this. Now, look at that first phrase of um, verse 1 of chapter 4. After this. Come on, say after this. Say it again. Say after this. Now, here's what I need you not to miss about this whole after this thing. Um, Just by way of literary context, really, really fast, John is banned to the Isle of Patmos, and he's banned for his faithfulness, his trust, his love of God. And as he's on this island of Patmos, God now is starting to reveal some things to John. He's trying to show him what's going to happen. He's showing him um, what theologians call uh, an eschatology or the end times of what is going to take place. So if you read chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, it details John's introduction to who God is. And then uh, specifically in chapter 3, uh, he starts to talk about the seven churches of Asia and the problems that, were, was, that the churches were encountering. So when you look at all those churches, Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and, and all of those churches, uh, the, the Spirit directed a message to the angel of the church to correct something that was going on in the church. Are you with me? Now, if you listen to Pastor Karen's message, here's how she said it last week. Moses had gone up to the mountain to receive a word from God. The people of God stayed in the valley, and they went back to that familiar thing because they felt God had distanced themselves from them. They created this calf, and and so they started to worship the calf. Moses came down and called the Levites out from among them. Y'all heard the message. And and to take the sword and, and to say, who? Who is for the Lord? Come on the Lord's side. And those that didn't come, he killed them. Okay? So after that, after the cleaning up, let me go back. Okay. Two weeks ago, Jesus met this woman at the well, and he said, I can give you something that will quench your thirst that will stop you from having to come here again. She said, give it to me to drink. He said, go call your husband and come back. After that. I wish I had somebody. (laughs) Because what I want you to understand with me is you cannot stay where you are and grow with God. If you're going to get to true worship, it must be after you've given up some things and get to a place of desperation where you're really, well, let me put myself in this, where we are truly desperate from God. So when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, after you have resolved to change, after we make the resolution that now we're going to worship God, after that, God extends an invitation for us to come join him. Put the first point on the screen. Come on, come on, come on. Say after this, y'all. Say, so now here's the thing. Every believer, now say it like this. Say, self, God is inviting me into his throne room. One more time. Say, self, God is inviting me into his throne room. Now do me a favor, okay? If you're sitting next to your wife, do not do this. If you're sitting next to your husband, do not do this. But if it's somebody that you don't know, just say, listen, if you're blocking me, after you, I'm going. Because <laughs> some things we need to cut loose. Everybody okay? Okay, so now notice this. After this, go back to the text. Let's walk it out. Notice what it says. It says, after this, I look, and there was a what? 
A door standing open where? Very, very, very important. The grammatical nuance in, in the verb uh, kind of implies that the door was always open. The problem is not that the door just opened, is we just hadn't moved to after this yet. And so we can't see the availability of God. Okay? So, number one, that door standing open kind of implies a constant invitation to come and worship God. The second implication of the door is that once we go in, God does not want us to come out. Oh, I wish I had. Woo! <laughs> I don't know about you, but if, if you ever get me where I finally meet God like that, I'm telling you, leave me alone. Come on, do I have any witness here? Any witnesses here? Go ahead and go on without me. I'm going to be just fine. Because I'm living life from the perspective of being in the presence of God. Say after this again. Okay, now watch the text. Let's walk. He says, I heard a voice, and, and, and I'm not going to bore you with the detail. That's talking about Jesus. And it was speaking to me like a trumpet, and it says, come up here. So here's the thing. Um, come up here. Th th you've been hearing this for the past four weeks. You can't stay where you are and grow with God. So when God opens the door in heaven, he's going to invite you to come where he is. And so we're going to have to make a shift to go where God is. Not that he's not omnipotent, not that he's not all of that, but he wants us in the throne room. Oh, come on, say amen. Okay? Now, watch this. Now, <laughs> we're moving quick, okay? Um, now, notice the second thing. Notice the second thing. Put the second point on the screen, and then I want to read real quick, okay? So once you're invited into the throne room, the reason for the invitation is to encounter God in all his fullness and majesty. Now, watch what it says in verse 2. At once, I was where? I was where? Very, very important. Very, very important. Very, very important. Because a lot of us don't know how to do that yet. At once, I was where? In the spirit. And the first thing I saw was a throne that stood in heaven with someone seated on the throne. Okay? Now, I, I, can you bring my throne out? I want, I want, I want you all to see this because I'm going to walk through this extensively. And, and this is going to be our throne. Okay, yeah, there you go. Put it, that's too close to me. I don't want to be that close to God yet. Yeah, right there. Yeah. I was in the spirit, and at once, he says, the first thing I saw, once I make the transition from the flesh to the spirit, is I saw God where he properly belonged. Hear me. If you are struggling with seeing God, for who he is, you haven't made the transition yet. Let's talk about true worship. Are you with me? Uh, because I want this throne to look this way for a specific reason. Is that John said, when I looked up, verse 2, at once I was in the spirit. Because once you get in the spirit, it's a completely different from being in the flesh. Because here's what I want you to understand. Worship in the flesh is restricted to the type of song and the rhythm of the beat. Worship in the flesh means that I've got to look a certain way. And I've got to do a certain thing. Come on, talk to me this morning. And I've got to behave in a certain way. Worship in the flesh, I've got to do the right run at the right song to tickle the right emotional fantasy in you to command a response. Worship in the flesh means that if you lead my song, I'm going to get mad with you because it's my song. Come on. Worship in the flesh says if you take my microphone from me, I want everybody to hear me, I'm going to get mad with you because it's my microphone. Worship in the flesh says, come on, if you're sitting in my seat, I'm going to get upset with you because you're in my seat. Worship in the flesh says, if you take my position in the church, and I've been in that position because I started the church, I'm going to get mad with you. And, and the problem with us, the reason we can't see God on the throne is because we're in the flesh. And the problem with being in the flesh, we're the ones on the throne Not God. And because I'm in the flesh and I can't see God on the throne, 
I'm going to get upset with you every time that you try to take me out of my position of authority. I'm just talking true worship because notice what John said. At once, I was in the spirit and I saw a throne. And then what I love about John's revelation of the throne is he uses what I'm going to refer to as anthropomorphic terms. Let me tell you what that means. He doesn't use human terms to describe God because if any of us fit the description of the human terms, we'd fool ourselves into thinking we are. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and what happens is because I pray three times a day, I mistakenly come out in the spirit. And if you don't pray three times a day, I say I look like God and you don't. Are you hearing me this morning? We're going to th true worship. So John uses interesting terms. He uses, you've heard scripture says, God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Let me tell you what that means. It's the source of light. All light emanates from him. So John uses these, 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 these jewels that are translucent tri tribe jewels that, that, that and light can pass through, and all you see is the glory of who God really is. Because Scripture says no man has seen God and live. So if you're seeing yourself on the throne, get up, get out the flesh, and let God be on the throne. Are you all right? You guys, we all right? Are we doing all right? I'm going to move quick. I'm going to move quick. Are we doing all right? Are we doing all right? Get off the throne. Get off the throne. Get off the throne. If you're still getting upset in church, you're still on it. <laughs> Let's read. Let's read. And, and so verse 3, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne, it says, was a rainbow that had the appearance of emerald. And go down to verse 5. Look at verse 5. And from the throne, it says, came flashings of lightning and rumblings and pearl of thunder. And before the throne, it says, there were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, it says, there was, as it was, a sea of glass like crystal. Now, he begins by saying, what's that first stone? It's, it's the stone of Jasper. And, and I want you all to see this. So, so visualize God on his throne and visualize this as a heavenly scene. And all of a sudden, this Jasper is reflecting the redness of God, which is blood that was shed on Calvary for your sin. And emanating from the stage, the, 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 it's the stone is changing all kinds of colors because you can't restrict God to one thing. And, and you can't block God in to say he looked like that. And so it's changing colors because he's just reflecting his glory and emanating his glory. And you can't put a face to him because you don't know what he looks like. You just know he's holy. And you can't put hands to him. And you can't put feet to him. But all you know is that he's sitting on the throne and he looks like Jack. Jasper, and he looks like carnelian. But what I like about the text, it says around the throne is this emerald. And emerald is green. And, and, and it talks about this green now is, is, is a symbol of a rainbow. And it's a strange shape because the rainbow is all around the throne. And what the rainbow is saying is connecting you to the covenant that he made with Noah. Never again will I destroy the world with a flood. But he's sitting on his throne in judgment. I'm judging the world with fire. Come on, say God on his throne. And watch this, watch this now. And then it says, emanating from the thrones is pearls of thunder and lightning. And then I like this part. Then in front of the stone, there's the seven spirits, or the seven candles, which are the spirit of God. Let me tell you what that says. The only way you can access God is by the spirit, which means that we must come up in the spirit to be able to see him. If you're in the flesh looking, we will never see God. Does this make sense? Okay. So the invitation is to come up to the throne room to encounter the holiness of God in all his transcendence, all his beauty, 
all his holiness. So John now is about to get a revelation of what worship really is. Third point. Let's walk through this. Okay. Now watch the third thing I want you all to get, and then we're going to move to this to hear what the text is really saying to us. Not only are you invited to the throne room to God, but listen to this now. Your challenge, your challenge, this is what I'm challenging every person here today, to develop a lifestyle of continual worship. Continual worship. We sang three songs today, and the spirit lingered. And some folk came out of worship. I can't put a word. All that singing ain't necessary. <laughs> Let's just go home and get to the word. Because that's why I came. I can sing by myself. <laughs> we don't understand worship. Are you with me? We don't understand worship. So now, watch, con say continual. continual. Say it again, say continual. continual. I need to belabor this point because I want you to understand what I'm saying. One more time, say continual. continual. That means it don't end. Okay? This is free. I am learning if I can stay in continual worship, my marriage will be Okay? Really, really, it would be. It would be. Um, most of you know my wife is in Arizona, and it's been three weeks, four days, five hours, three minutes. <laughs> Help a brother out, all right? <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, brother can't drink so much water. <laughs> Ain't no cooking. And so, yeah, the trial went on. And other things are happening, and I'm like, Lord, can I get out of worship just for a minute? You know, and, but you have to stay in the presence of God. And she called me Saturday, do you want me to come home, baby? And I want to holler, yeah. But it's not about me. But you see, when you get in the flesh, it's always about, yeah, yeah, I get it, because I'm on the throne. You're getting it. So if I stay in continual worship, I make the decision, decisions from the perspective of always being in the presence of God. I'll take God over her any day. <laughs> wow. Let's walk, okay? So now watch this now. Verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones... And seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. Jump down to verse 6b. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And the first living creature, like a lion, the second one looked like an ox, the third living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight, verse 8, and the four living creature, each of them had six wings. They're full of eyes all around and within. Now, can y'all bring my, my, yeah, bring, I want y'all to see this. Bring the four chairs first. Um, I, need, I need four elders real quick, um, if you don't mind. Um, I think we got about four. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Good to see you, man. You made it up to heaven, bro? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good. Yeah, don't, don't move the chair, man. Come on, you just, just like that. Sit down, sit down. Like this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Gazing, I need two more. Pastor Karen, where you at? Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Let me get, come on, Gordon, I need one more. Yeah, I don't see, I don't see Brenda. Come on, yeah. Good. Don't take your eyes off of God. Yeah. Can you bring the other chairs, please? Yeah, thank you. I want, I want to talk about this, yeah. Just spread them out as far as you can. Yeah. Yeah, good, good, good. Amen. 
Yeah, someone this side, on that side over there. Thank y'all. I need the yeah, ministerial team, y'all. Come on, come on. Oh, some those that think you could make it up to heaven. <laughs> yeah, come on, just yeah, come on. Sit around these. Sit around, yeah. Sit around, sit around, sit around. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Assume there's 24. I need these chairs filled, yeah. Come on, yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Good. Okay, guess you just made it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Good man. Robert, you stay. You can stay. Rock, come on. You come on. I need some people. Y'all come on. I need, come on, Michelle. I need some people. Jerona, come on. You need to get to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just messing. I want y'all to see this. Yeah, I want, I want y'all to get this. Yeah. How many more people do we need to make it in? One more? Okay, who we have over here? Siobhan, come on. Yeah. No, we need too many women. You stay. Let me get a man. Come on. Yeah, yeah we, need, we need all the men to make it in. Well, I know, I know. I'm not being chauvinistic, but the church is filled with women. That's why the men aren't coming. So we need, we need some men. Yeah, good. Is that all right? Now, here's what I want you to see about this illustration. Visualize this as the throne room of heaven. And, and let me work through what's going on. Please notice the throne is vacant. When you come to worship, you're not worshiping the pastor. When you come to worship, you're not worshiping the worship leader. When you come to worship, you're not worshiping the band or the worship team. You're not worshiping the ushers. You're worshiping God on his throne. Can, can, we, can we begin there, people? Can we begin there? We come to worship God. And the text pointedly says, now, in our worship, we talked about what emanates from the throne. But notice the inner circle of the throne. It says there are four chairs on the throne. I mean, sitting around and before the throne. And those two verbs are very important. Is that they're around, but they're facing, they're looking at the throne. Because the object of their worship is he who sits on the throne. Does that make sense? And then I want you to notice more importantly, the text, as you look at it, it talks about the ox, the lion, the man, and the eagle in flight is representative of the most powerful animals, human beings, or creatures that God has created. So what the author is trying to get us to understand is that God in all his powerful creation has these most powerful created entities postured for worship. Come on, is this making sense? And then it says, seated now, outside, around the throne, are 24 other thrones. And the text says that there are elders sitting on them. And these are representative of, let me just say, us, the congregation, those of us that come to worship and we cry out to God. Now, let me walk, walk with this through me. Go to verse, go to verse 8, and I want you to see what the text says. And I want to draw some illustration from heaven, all right? This is what worship looks like in heaven. Come on, say worship in heaven. Worship in heaven. Not worship at church, but worship in heaven. Say worship in heaven. Worship. And in case you're wondering where I'm going, Matthew chapter 6 still says, um, Your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth. How? As it is in heaven, meaning that what happens on earth ought to be a mirror image of the way worship is going on in heaven. Come on, does this make sense? If we're trying to create stuff on earth that doesn't look like heaven, we might just want to stop it real quick. But it ought to look like heaven. So let me tell you what worship looks like in heaven, okay? Look at verse 8. It says here now, and the four living creatures, each of them, had six wings full of eyes all around them. Look at verse B. And day and night, they never ceased saying. <sighs> now, I don't get ahead of me. Don't get ahead of me. See? Yeah, I want to get ahead because that's the problem with the church. <laughs> we don't like the day and night part, but we like the holy part. Day and night kind of implies or connotes never-ending worship. If, if this were written in today's vernacular, it would say 24-7 worship. 
They didn't come here at 830 and then looked at their watch at 11. Because they understood when they left here, they just transitioned to another place of, yeah, yeah. Because they live life from a perspective of constantly being in the presence of God. Okay? Now, now notice this. It says day and night. Come on, say, they never stop. They never say it again. Say, they never stop. They never so here's what that meant. These four living creatures never left the presence of God. Never. Never. They didn't say, hey, y'all, excuse the vernacular, we fit in the inner in. They were already entered in, and there was no entering out so they can re-enter in again. If your worship consists of entering in and entering out, you might want to check who's sitting on your throne. Because <laughs> once we go in, we ought to be in the whole time. Does this make sense? Let me hurry up. Let me hurry up, okay? It says here, day and night, they never cease saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I need y'all to say this, not y'all just the, the folk on the inside. Hold, listen to me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who, what's, what's it say? Who was and is and is to come. Say it with me. Three, go. Holy. Hold. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Not the outside people. Y'all don't say this. Just these people. Say it like you mean it. One more count on the country. One, two, three. Say it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's cute, but pretend like Bronco just scored and say it like you mean it. Come on. Yeah, say holy, holy. Come on, say it, say it. Hey, Derek, 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 do it like you're doing visitor recognition. And you know how you get, yeah, 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 yeah. come on, do it, y'all, hit, hit it again, go ahead, go for it, go for it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Good, now say whenever, y'all say whenever. whenever. Say it again, say whenever. whenever. That is a word that sets something else in motion and connotes timing. Okay? Nothing happens till this declaration is made. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Y'all say it with me. Come on, say it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Notice what happened when that is proclaimed. Okay? Now, before I miss this, day and night, they never stop saying. They weren't singing. They were speaking. A lot of us can't worship if it's not in song form because we don't know what to say. So we need a psalmist to create our worship verbiage for us. And we can't worship God because we don't know the words to the song. No, 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 no. My worship ought to be me saying what God is to me. You're an awesome God. You're a mighty God. You're a phenomenal God. You're my savior. You're my healer. You're my deliverer. You brought me from cancer, and you're going to keep me out of it. You Come on, come on, come on, come on. And I say to him who he is. Here's what our worship looks like. When the song ends, we're like, I don't know what else to say. Because we ran out of words. If you can't talk to God about God without a song, you really don't know who. Oh, I wish I had somebody. <laughs> Ask me to describe Katani to you. You had to tell me, shut up after a while, by and by. That's how it ought to be. 
that we serve, when the song ends, that ought to be an opportunity for the angelic cry to be ushered up because all of us can open our mouths and say, we thank you, God. We magnify you. We glorify you. I don't need a song. And we never stop saying. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? I'm almost there. So, so here's a practicum. When you go home, put your clock on, and for 60 seconds, try to talk to God about how beautiful he is and see how quick it'll take you to run out of words. Right? Don't sing a song. Talk to him. Does this make sense? Now, here's the best part of this. Verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, verse 10, this is the rest of y'all. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. Watch the action. Watch the action. I'm going to stop after this. They cast their crown before the throne, saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed. Let me read it again, verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who seated on the floor, throne, who lives for and ever, ever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Notice what they do. They cast their, thr- their thrones before the throne and look at what they say. Worthy are you, O God, to receive glory and honor and power and glory for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Let me try something. Y'all got that? Y'all know what to do? Y'all was paying attention? Okay. Do your things. Holy God. One, two, three. Do your thing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Holy, holy, holy Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Come on up. Come on up. Sit down. Sit down again. Sit down. Sit down. I'm doing this for a reason. Because that really is the problem with the church. We don't know what to do when the declaration is made. And we go home with our problems and take it out on each other. Because we don't know what to do. When we find ourselves in the spirit. And so we're fumbling. Do I just repeat holy, holy? Or do I say you're worthy? Give me a scripture. Give me a scripture. Hey, pastor, where was that scripture at again? Because we don't know what to do when it comes to worship. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Myself included. Okay. Because there are times I'll hear the holy, holy, holy. But I'm so much in the flesh that I don't care. Come on, y'all. So let's try it one more time. Let's try it one more time. All right? Elders, do your thing. Count of three. One, two, three. Just do it once, yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, O Lord of God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. Good. Y'all be said one more time. Okay, Daron, stand up. Hang on, don't clap yet. All y'all stand up. All y'all get back on the chairs. We're gonna try it one more time. Now sit down on your chairs. Um, yeah, I want you to stay right there. He got it right. So I don't want him to do it again. Okay, move out the circle. You made it to the Holy of Holies, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Now, don't make the mistake of putting yourself on the throne. <laughs> just bless I'll just, yeah, yeah, there you go. Let's try it one more time. And excuse me, I told you I need to belabor this point. One more time. Elders, go for it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is and is and is to 
It's all good. Okay, yeah. Okay, y'all can sit back up again. Y'all missed it. It's okay. Go back to the text. Let's go to the text. Let me show you something. Stay standing, Dayron. Verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives for and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they do what? Cast their crowns where? Before the throne, before they speak. My problem is, Marriage Michelle, can I borrow and borrow Dayron's? Let me let's stay there. The implication that's connoted with throneship is I'm the king and I've got a crown on my head. And my crown is my symbol of authority and power. And it defines who I am. If there's one king in the throne room, are you with me? And the declaration is made holy, holy, holy. It doesn't matter what authority you achieved in life and brought with you into that throne room. When God is on the throne, you take that thing off and you lay it at the feet of Jesus because he is in control. And the reason we fight so much in church, in life, on the job is because we want to see who's got the biggest crown on their head and nobody is willing to lay their crown down at the feet of Jesus and the fight is all about position and authority. Get why? Because we want to be worshipped. Let's try this one more again. All right? Go for it. Darren, you can join them. I think they got it now. Go for it. Last time. One, two, three. Go for it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is and is the Son. Glory you, To receive glory and honor and power. For you all things. And by your will they existed and were created. Okay, now, that's so. I wanted them to do it once. Now, let me show you something real quick, and then I'm going to end because I think you got the point. The text says, day and night, they what? Never stop saying. So guess what? This, they just finished saying their thing, and I saw Donna. She threw her crown. And so watch this. While Donna is walking over to the throne to pick up her crown, to put it back on her head to go to her seat, guess what happens? They holler, holy, holy, holy again. You got, and so guess what she's got to do? she got to throw it back all over again and to go back. And the moment she try to pick it up again, guess what happens? They holler, holy, holy, holy. And guess what she's got to do? She's got to take it off and she's got to throw it again. And the moment she go to pick it up, guess what's going to happen? They going to holler, holy, holy, holy. And guess what's going to happen? she got to take it off and she's going to, I wish I had somebody up in here is that when you are in the presence of God, are you hearing me? We don't have time to fight for who we are. I don't understand fighting in the body of Christ if we are in the presence of God. What are we fighting for? You don't have time to pick up your crown, baby, because the moment you reach for that thing, the angels are hollering, holy... I wish I had somebody. You don't have time to have an attitude with your sister because the moment the attitude comes, somebody hollers, oh, yeah, you get it, you get it, and you've got to take the thing off and cast it. Does this make sense? So this is what it looks like. If I have an attitude with somebody in the church, I need to look in the mirror and check to see what's on top of my head. Did I throw it down 
Or did I ignore the holy holies and picked it up? Thank you. Come on, show them some love. Tony, come on. Show them some love. I want to flesh that out. I want to, and I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. But I want us to get that. If I'm in continual worship, I make decisions based on the fact that I'm on my knees in the presence of God with my throne, my crown off my head. Now that can go. And I'm worshiping God. So if the flesh is giving birth to flesh, maybe I step out of heaven, (laughs) forgot whose presence I was in. (sighs) Resolve to worship God means that I must give up some things. So when the world sees me, It's like when Moses came off the mountain in Pastor Karen's message and the Israelites encountered him. There was a glow about him. And all they could see was God on his face. When the world sees you and the world sees me, they ought to know that we are living in the presence of God. You guys can position those mics back where they go. And if they don't see the glory and the radiance and the majesty and the splendor. Let me say it this way. The light of God emanating from us. We might want to check where were we? Were we really in the presence of God? Play that. I want to come on, stand to your feet.